Well, well, welcome to Lab Life with the Air Force Research Laboratory. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Kenneth. Today we are joined by Dr. Anthony Fries of the Epidemiology Lab and Dr. Paul Schober, who works at the Defense Health Agency at USAF SAM. They are cotton swab collecting disease detectives, keeping epidemics at bay. In three, two, one. Today we are joined by Dr. Fries and Dr. Schoberg. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Starting off, Dr. Fries, uh, how does a veterinary student or someone who works with veterinary students end up working for the DOD Epi Lab? I started out as a birder by hobby. It's just sort of a side hobby that I had. I was an avid birder and I was approached after my master's program at Ohio State University by the veterinary school there um, where they needed somebody who had some expertise in molecular biology and also in birding uh, to be able to track and follow and identify and characterize different avian communities. Note to young listeners out there that is not a burgeoning field of research and a career path, but follow your hobbies, they might lead to something. Uh, anyways, I was approached by the vet school and they were interested in having a biologist who could characterize influenza in wild bird communities. Um, and I emphasize wild bird here because domesticated birds would be chickens, turkeys, that industry is also important in what we're gonna get into with influenza. But in the wild bird community, I think we'll get into more of the evolutionary history of flu here in a moment. But I started out by having some experience that was needed. And I think as we get into the discussion of influenza, we have a lot of different expertise uh, from public health to uh, physicians to epidemiologists to molecular biologists that, and wildlife biologists that all comes together to play into control of influenza. Specifically, I think what you might be looking for is some of my experience in following those birds. It required me to leverage some relationships that I, I, I had not previously had um, with hunters uh, is one way, a, a convenient way to get your hands on wild birds. And so specifically here, what I'm talking about with wild birds would be waterfowl. Uh, so if you think of ducks, geese, shorebirds, they're difficult to catch. There's different ways that you can conveniently catch them with rocket nets where you might put some corn into an open field uh, and you have charges and uh, just sort of heavy canisters that you explode and it'll carry a net over these duck communities that might be coming in to forage around the corn. And that's one way to catch live birds. And then we'd band them and we'd follow them up, or, up and down the Mississippi Flyway. But in addition, there's an even easier way to get your hands on these birds would be from hunters because there's a pretty avid hunting community here in North America and you can pitch along with these hunters that come out of the marshes and have certain bag limits and, 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 and maybe some mallards in there or northern pintails and all of these birds actually have influenza which again we'll talk about in a moment but the key thing to remember is to sample from these wild birds is you have to flip them over and, and you stick uh, cotton swabs up their rear ends and, and, and so there's a certain amount of time and a certain distance that you have to stick these cotton swabs in to get an accurate sample. But, but the looks on those hunters' faces <laughs> and, and to try to discuss with them why you want to do it was probably my most, most adventurous or I don't know if that really translated to my experience here in the DOD. I don't think I was ever hired for that, those interactions. <laughs> I mean, you're good with challenging conversations. Definitely. Uh, when, when you have to, there's, there's some folks, no offense to, I, I, I am an avid supporter of the wild waterfowl hunting, um, but they are a skeptical group. And uh, so you'd have conversations for an hour sometimes with just people coming out of the marsh and uh, you know, they come out and expecting just to get in their truck and they want to sit there and listen to you talk about the evolutionary history of influenza and why it's important for us to be out there and following these viruses around in wild birds. But there are your others who are, are holding a gun pretty tightly uh, and, you know, you have to not look like a game warden. So there's, there's a lot of um, certain, I, I really dealt with the, the, the whole gauntlet of, uh, of you know, of the American society out there when you're out there in the marshes with those individuals. That's but, incredible. Yeah. Like, well, how long did this study go for? 
Oh, well, so this was part of my doctoral work at Ohio State University and, and some brilliant vets that are there that hired me to sort of do this, some of this work. And we were out there for about five years following birds up and down the flyways in North America. And so to, to reiterate, influenza is, it's, its evolutionary roots are in birds. And so while we think of flu as a, you, I cough on you, you get flu, you know, you might go to the hospital. In birds, it's an asymptomatic infection. And so these birds, and, and it's not respiratory. So to reiterate here, it is, it is not a duck coughing on another duck. It's actually an enteric infection. So it, these birds shed it through their uh, cloacas or the rear end that you're sticking a Q-tip up or a, a cotton swab up. And then as the other birds mill around and feed, they're ingesting those influenza viruses. And to reiterate again, this is not a, a symptomatic infection. And so these birds can carry and shed these viruses, but they can also the next day get up and move 500 miles across North America to a different migratory location. So they're just like a host. Exactly. A really, really convenient host for the virus. And so you think of this, this asymptomatic relationship and it's, these viruses have the perfect setup they can move around across the globe, hitch their ride with these migratory waterfowl and, and shorebird species that can move anywhere at any time. There are huge explosions of young, immunologically naive waterfowl bir birds that uh, as they're fledging that will be encountering these influenza viruses. And so it's a free ticket for influenza viruses to move around the globe. Um, and that's why we were so interested in following these birds is to sort of understand on a root level because ultimately the flu that we're circulating today during this influenza season right now had its roots at some point in the avian community. And so our hopes at Ohio State and with a number of researchers across the globe was to understand that at a root level and maybe tease out some of the uh, influences that uh, ultimately gets into humans. So when you were like collecting the samples and stuff, you'd go back to your lab and category like what type of influenza it was or where where it's appearing or how did how's that work yeah so so in humans we have about three or four different types of influenza that we share amongst each other in birds and and again we're talking about one species of humans we're not talking about thousands but in birds you're talking about thousands of different bird species and you would take a cotton or a cotton swab from a mallard in northwest ohio for instance you would take it back to the laboratory. You would inject uh, uh, some of that into a embryonating chicken egg. Uh, so it's a growing egg and it would amplify the virus up and then you would take it and you'd characterize it in a number of different ways. You would say whether it has hemagglutination capabilities, uh, what sort of diversity was in there. And so while I said humans have about three or four different types, birds can have hundreds of different types of combinations of influenza. So maybe in humans, you might have heard of like H3N2 or H1N1. Those are a single different type of flu. In birds, you can have H16N5, H7N9, H5N1, H1N1. That diversity is so broad that we would take it back to the lab and try to sort of classify it, try to characterize it and see whether there were any patterns across the landscape, whether bird movement influenced how that diversity was established in certain pockets of the world. And so there are people all over the world. There's, it's sort of our little niche community when, we were, when I was in grad school that uh, you know, you'd, you'd have maybe a H10 uh, showing up in uh, a sea duck up in Green Bay or up in uh, Alaska. Uh, there's some great diversity that is just sort of isolated to certain communities of you know, sea ducks, for instance. In Green Bay, you have an, a, a group of ducks that actually overwinter in Green Bay. Uh, while most of your mallards here in Ohio might go down to the Mississippi uh, River Valley, you've got birds up there that are shedding their and, and circulating their own little unique sets of viruses. And so, for instance, one of the cool things we found at one point uh, during our studies was that there was an H14 uh, virus that hadn't been seen in 20 years. It was last seen in uh, the middle of uh, Siberia. Uh, back in the 1980s, wow. and all of a sudden, in fact, it was probably 30 years or so now that I think about it, we found it in a duck in Green Bay. All of a sudden, How's uh, that it was in a, 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 what was that? Was it a white-winged scoter? 
how is it possible is the fact that uh, what's even makes it more fascinating is that some people have found or you know you might see in a story or in a in a movie at some points where maybe a virus sits in a uh, or a bacteria sits in sort of an ice in a glacier and, and it melts and that virus comes out and while that was our initial hypothesis was like oh this is fascinating maybe it was just in permafrost and all of a sudden came out you know you're picturing middle of nowhere Siberia and these viruses just sitting there waiting for uh, climate change or something like that. But when you looked at the virus more closely, what you saw was that it had evolved over 30 years exactly how you would expected it to evolve. And so just like 30 years ago, I could tell you what an H3N2 may have looked like in the 1980s because it's changed and it's circulated through hosts. That H14 virus also was the exact same scenario where it had evolved. So clearly it was circulating in these wild bird communities, but we've just never sampled it. Um, so it's kind of like that needle in a haystack or when we talk about the amount of biodiversity that's been characterized in the world, uh, you know, you talk about tropical rainforests and the number of insects that haven't been characterized in viruses. We're talking probably tip, tip of the iceberg oh, sort yeah. of scenario here where there's just probably a lot of unknown diversity out there that we have yet to even find. And you mentioned how that diversity is pretty, it shows at least with influenza and birds, how is it only, we only have about three strains you said humans can get? Like how does that not transfer more to us? All right, yeah. So why do we have three different types of influenza in, in humans? It, it's because we are a spillover host for these viruses. And so the vast amount of diversity that you see asymptomatic infections in birds only spills over into humans once in a while. And so those events are so isolated and so infrequent that it's just as a matter of randomness that in 2009 for instance that there was the h1n1 swine flu yeah that was a unique combination of reassorted segments of an influenza virus that found a unique opportunity to have both avian human and swine viruses co-infect or sort of intermingle in certain host species, in this case a, swan, a, a pig, and had that opportunity to reassort, find a perfect combination, and then spill over into humans and s ultimately, in the matter of months, sweep across the entirety of the globe. In fact, to the point where it displaces the current H1 virus at that time that had been circulating in humans. And so you get these moments in history, and it's happened about four times in, 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 our, in the last century, for instance, where you have a spillover of a virus and it just runs rampant and it fixates itself and we to this day are still trying to create vaccines to control for that one event that may have happened maybe at a county fair in uh, middle of nowhere Minnesota for instance that event defines how we handle and address influenza uh, seasonally now. So the spillover events are when it actually goes from uh, an animal, a, a pig, or a, a bird, a wild bird, to humans, or a domesticated bird even? Yes, yeah, and so with influenza, that's, that, that's where you make the distinction between domesticated and, and wild bird species. So wild birds, it's a, a daily occurrence, these, this diversity is intermingling. But once it gets into a poultry industry, you have, you're talking about then a single, very similarly, uh, aged and immunologically similar, highly dense, highly populated, tight confined location where an H5N1, for instance, might spill over from a wild bird host, get into this population of poultry, and that would be your spillover event, yes. It, it's tough to characterize because it's so infrequent in, in the grand scheme of things. It's so infrequent because when you think about it from wild birds, it's no big deal that an H5N1 is circulating in a mallard popula population in Florida. But in, wild, in domesticated birds, it's sort of that first instance where you may see that evolutionary diversity spilling over and getting one step closer into the human population. And so that is what CDC and, and, and ourselves are so fixated on, are those moments in time when that diversity spills over into pigs or into poultry and potentially could get into humans. And so H5N1, uh, big scare back in the 2000s, still circulating. H7N9 is the more recent one within the last five or six years. 
is a representation of a spillover event that has become stuck or fixated in those communities. So in South in China right now, H7N9 is has been circulating since 2013 or so, and occasionally at times will spill over into humans. And the issue with it at this moment is that it only really takes a few mutations or substitutions to turn that virus into a human to human situation. We've been really, really lucky in the fact that those H7N9s and those H5N1s that are looming on the horizon have not accrued those mutations to make it easily transmissible in humans. But that's what we're actually looking for. We're, we're monitoring to make sure that those mutations don't occur and that that spillover event doesn't happen. And so there are extensive control efforts to try to stop those spillover events. And you've thrown around a lot of the H's and the N's. And yes, it's something that sorry. I didn't grow up knowing what that really meant. You know, you H1N1, you know, wash your hands. But what does the H and the N actually stand for and correspond to the numbers? So the H and the N actually correspond to the surface proteins on these viruses. And so when it gets into your body, the H and the N are the little globular heads that interact with your immune cells. So your body recognizes a virus based on that H and that N. And so you may have had an H1N1 infection last year and your body had seen an H and an N1 and 1 um, and your body reacted accordingly. This year you might have an H3N2 and there's just a little bit of change structurally to that body, uh, that, that globular head that allows it to interact with the cells in your body. And so what the H and the N do is it's the mechanism by which to get into your cells, hijack your replication system, and create replicates of itself. And so that H and N is extremely important when you're talking about something that we haven't seen before, for instance, like an H7N9. And, and, and your body has no idea how to react to an H7N9. Um, and so in a normal seasonal influenza, the thing about H7N9 and H5N1 and our body's reactions to it is that we overreact. Um, and these it's scenarios where something like a cytokine storm it may have heard in the, the news or something like that. But that's what causes these high mortality issues when an H7N9 ultimately spills over into a human. Because we're sitting at somewhere between 20 and 40 percent mortality when you do get that influenza infection. And that's the concern is that it, when you're talking about 40 percent of people who are infected with H7N9 ultimately die. It's, it's concerning from that regard. Now, that's probably not going to be the one that sweeps in the next pandemic uh, because you'd run out of your host. You'd exhaust your host if you're killing everything. And so those mutations that it would have to accrue on that H7 and H N9 or any globular head of an H and an N in combination would have to sort of attenuate itself in order to maybe go down to a 1% mortality rate so that it, you know, it can still, it's ridiculously transmissible, um, but it doesn't want to kill its host. It just wants to get to the next host. And what did the H and the NH stand for? Sorry, hemagglutinate, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase are okay. the H and the N. And so the key point about an influenza virus is that it's segmented um, and that it has different segments that it can interchange with uh, other viruses. And so um, if I get infected with an H1 and an H3, uh, they could swap, for instance, and all of a sudden the new virus might have a new internal proteins and new external proteins, and that's how you get these reassortment events where swine flu in 2009 came out. So to put in perspective for some people, I mean, we talked about evolution, how quickly these can change. Um, even in humans, how fast can the influenza virus evolve or adapt while going from host to host? Uh, seasonally, those viruses would change moderately over the course of a season. So when we get into maybe talking about the vaccines a little bit more, those viruses can change over the course of a year where they're still similar, but they evolve rather quickly. So the virus that goes into your body is probably accruing some substitutions or mutations and coming out on the other end into the next host with some modifications. Ultimately, it's still the same H1N1 virus, for instance. However, the thing we worry about the most in a pandemic situation and why influenza is obviously the most uh, worried about global pathogen is the fact that it can change overnight in reality. And so you could have a, those reassortment events that I was just talking about where you have a completely unforeseen virus that arises based on just 
happenstance. And that's why a lot of the, the experts out there, we all think that it's probably not going to be that the next pandemic event probably won't be something that you currently see right now. It's gonna be something that is unforeseen. It's happened every time. 2009, we had no idea that that swine flu combination was gonna come back and did. And, and, and so while we watch H5N1, it's probably not gonna be H5N1 that uh, you know, goes global. Well, and to kind of trans transition, as we've gotten a you know, really good uh, education now of what the flu virus is, how it evolves from animals and the history of it and your, and your background. We flash forward today, you're working at the Air Force Research Laboratory and uh, segment of the uh, United States School of Aerospace Medicine in the Epidemiology Lab or short ep Epi Lab. What, what do you do there and how does that relate to the conversation we just had? Or well, um, to segue into that first, so how, how do we work within this program to be able to, to identify when things are changing? And so we kind of have two parts. One where that we're actually doing surveillance, we're actually out globally at uh, military installations and we collect specimens from individuals that are ill, uh, looking for uh, certain uh, symptoms that would help us potentially identify a respiratory virus and specifically influenza. Uh, do they have a fever? Do they have a cough or a sore throat? And from that, working with providers that are on the front line, they collect a specimen on that patient and then they send it to us. And so then we receive that specimen and it goes to our epi lab and what Dr. Fries has been talking about. Then they are looking for those changes. Uh, so we work with um, the military, work with both CONUS and OCONUS military installations uh, to be able to see if something is occurring and trying to be on that front line then working with the CDC on oh okay we're having patients that are getting ill and appear to be uh, hospitalized or have more serious symptoms and th those are of interest because uh, as Dr. Fries was mentioning, the, the virus is, is always changing. And so we want to be there looking for that change to be able to then provide it to the CDC and then to move to that vaccination, uh, change in the vaccine if necessary. So Dr. Schoberg, you really have really great and unique data because you said OCONUS and CONUS, so that for our listeners, that means domestically in the United States, we have service members across the country sending in their samples when they're going for, for healthcare to a visit, they're sending their swabs to a to your, your location, yes. but then also we have service members deployed or stationed across the globe. So you're really getting like almost a, a, a chunk of the globe look at, you know, who's experiencing influenza, what type and when, you know, when it's appearing. Correct. And what uh, we work well with the CDC and WHO in that we're sometimes in areas where they may not be able to get specimens. Um, or where we're able to provide them um, a good sampling, a, a good look where they're also getting specimens, but um, we're able to provide you know, additional information from, from, from our, our patients, be it active duty and, and also beneficiaries. So we receive from, from both. And then what does the CDC and World Health Organization ultimately do with this, this data set we're providing? And, and I'll kind of start that and then Dr. Fries can probably add on, but as we look at the changes within the virus, are there mutations occurring? Are there things that are changing on, on that virus? Are we seeing something unique? And then we share that information with the CDC, sit down with them um, and discuss, hey, we're seeing this, uh, oh, we're also seeing this, and then help push that uh, change potentially to the vaccine each year. And, and it's crucial, since it is always changing, this is, this is, in a sense, something that where we're constantly have to be looking, not only during the, the typical flu season in the winter, but also during the summer. And influenza, it, 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 it doesn't care uh, where it's at, be it in down south, like in Australia or South America, or whether it's in North America, Europe, or, or Asia. Uh, it is, it's changing, it's, it's, it's in the uh, um, different populations, and so we're always trying to see and identify if, if something's occurring. Yeah, exactly. And, and because we have service members all over the globe, we have to sort of monitor more so than any other domestic surveillance system to, to sort of address those constantly changing environments that our service members are in. I think for WHO and CDC's interaction, it sort of emphasizes that 
the vaccine process is a really, really, we operate on a really archaic vaccine infrastructure. And so our manufacturing process takes a long time. So six to eight months you can take before you make decisions about what you think the population should be vaccinated against in the coming season. And so in February, in the Northern Hemisphere at least, WHO, CDC, FDA, DOD gets together and makes decisions on the previous season, what we've been seeing thus far. And at that point, you characterize, you do your best effort to sort of in, take a very educated guess of, off of a lot of data that's been accrued to say to the industry reps that are sitting at the table with you, these are the candidate viruses that we think that you should take back to your laboratories. We want you to grow those in egg-based systems, mostly egg-based, the vast majority, and amplify it and grow it enough that we can then mass distribute it across the globe to the benefit of prevention of influenza. But if you get that guess wrong, you're then six to eight months behind in the generation of, a, an, a, of an emergency vaccine, for instance. And so it's just sort of another emphasis as to why we watch this so closely, because like we said, overnight, these could change and go a direct, different direction than what a lot of the forecasters think that these are going towards and it can have some global ramifications and certainly to our service members sitting in Australia uh, that may suffer because of it. And so that's why we watch it so closely and work with CDC and FDA on these things. And you mentioned that, um, so how you select these viruses or give that, you said, very educated guess off this data. Is there like a, a percent that you see this pop up in the population or it's just this is what we see as burgeoning, like this one's clearly on the rise? Often, yes, we're kind of, I, I tell, um, sites that, that I go out to to try to um, encourage them to submit specimens to us that we're kind of chasing our tails sometimes because we're, we're trying to project, project out. But that is what we're looking for when it comes to the changes. Because also, uh, we may see different things occurring and so it's kind of looking at the epi side of it. Are we seeing something more that is, is starting to arise? than what is normal, than what we haven't seen in the past? Or, or is it kind of just sitting there um, low level? There's some changes that have occurred, but it isn't um, impacting our population at large numbers. And so those are sort of the things that have to be discussed, determined. Is there enough occurrence, is, is there enough of our population uh, globally that would, would be impacted by this? that, okay, we need to make that change. Or, okay, this is just kind of under the radar. We need to keep watching it and determining, okay, at this point, it will not create a pandemic or it won't create issues um, in the next year's season. So it's, it's a lot of uh, sleuth work, uh, a lot of really digging deep and communication, communication because we may be seeing something a little different than WHO is seeing or CDC. But again, I, I love that how we all work in synergy in this program because we're all sometimes seeing something a little different that all helps make that final decision. So uh, something our viewers like to hear is a, a favorite piece of historic Air Force technology or even a researcher that kind of influenced you. But going along that strain, do you have any major success stories in the history uh, you've worked here with the Epi Lab uh, and beyond? Yes, uh, I have one that is really fascinating. In the late 2000s, as there was the concern with the H5N1, uh, DOD appropriately started to, okay, how can we make our influenza surveillance more robust? How can we better identify if something novel is occurring out there? And in 2009, we've already talked about it, there was the, the pandemic, the pandemic H1N1. And because of what we were able to do within our lab and also our partner lab in California, we identified the first H1N1 viruses in the U.S., in California and in Texas. And because of what we were able to find and what the CDC found fascinating with that as we saw this change occur, they came to us and asked for that virus and that virus was then utilized as a seed virus for the vaccine, for that pandemic vaccine. So your team was the first, so you were there when they actually found this? Yes. 
That's incredible. So you mentioned that you actually helped get the information to the CDC. Correct. Um, not only did we, we first share that what we have um, found something novel here. Already they had been looking, the, there were cases that were occurring in Mexico, and so there was concern that this was going to become a pandemic. And so our, our ability to identify that change and then share that with the CDC, both us and um, our, our partners in California, the Naval Health uh, Research Center, were able to then provide that directly to the CDC. So what is that like looking back almost 10 years ago now? Like how has that kind of changed either how the processes have worked or at least how you view these events? For me, it's just like mentioned, why, why do I feel that this is a success story? It just shows how this uh, program that we've set up, the ability to identify quickly something that's occurring in the population, and in this case it occurred in, in the military population, how that is responsive, that's responsive to the needs of not only the U.S., but globally. What did the day-to-day -day kind of look like for you guys with all this stuff coming in? Because I can imagine it's probably a lot of different um, cotton or swabs and stuff sent your way to, to verify and check. Yes, and that's the, also kind of the beauty of how we have our lab um, in that it can handle large volumes. We, we see a lot of specimens, not only for respiratory, but um, across DOD that we receive. And in a, a day, uh, we could be receiving um, nearly 200 specimens or more. And uh, during the course of the season, uh, this past season, uh, we had over 12,000 oh that goodness. we received. And then also we partner with other labs uh, that are within this network um, within DOD, and we evaluated uh, over 20,000 different uh, viruses and results that were, that were seen. And then the Epilab itself, could you explain what all the work you um, do there is? It, it's not just, you know, determining flu and tracking flu, but you have a much larger mission than that. Correct. Uh, we're considered a reference lab. And so we provide support not only for respiratory, but um, testing for our, 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 our trainees our, that are coming through, any, any um, serology that they would need, meaning um, are they, do they need vaccination for different things? Uh, we do HIV testing, we do testing for sexually uh, transmitted infections. And, and so in the course of a year, they will evaluate over two million tests. Two million. Mm -hmm. So this is really like centralized operation to get some synergies be beyond the data, just the, the scale of your operation here is huge. Yeah, it represents about a, a group of just awesome people, about a hundred people in the EpiLab itself that you have logistics experts, you have laboratory professionals, you have epidemiologists, you have really, as you said, sort of the synergistic situation and environment where yeah, you, one day you could be processing uh, 100 FedEx boxes that are coming through the door. And to see it is, it's kind of, it was one of the most awe-inspiring things when I first arrived at the lab was just to see the machine working. And, and when I say machine, just the processing and getting these specimens to, to the different sections that are across the laboratory from doing STD, you know, sexually transmitted disease testing to the HIV group to groups doing antimicrobial resistance measures to TB cultures to respiratory specimens uh, processing. And so it, it never is boring there and it's all a tribute to the awesome team that sort of sits there in the lab. And also what I um, would add to that is also their responsiveness handling this large volume of, of testing, being able to get results back to that frontline provider to help them make decisions on treatment. And it is truly a, a marvel to see it work in how well then um, we're responsive to, to our, our, our physicians that are out there in the front line. So going along those lines, um, what would you say is a major innovation or breakthrough in flu vaccination, either techniques or research that you think many folks around the nation or the world may not know? Yeah, I guess the, the key thing to focus on here is that I know I've, I've mentioned that our current vaccine situation is tenuous in a, in a way. I mean, it, there's some limitations to our current vaccine manufacturing process. The effort lately and where a bunch of money, a bunch of money from Congress has been allocated is in the creation of a universal 
flu vaccine. Uh, so a lot of the effort, and we're still uh, several years off from an actual tangible product, I, I would guess. But instead of going after that H and N1 and looking for uh, a, a correlative protection that might be the, if you create an antibody to that surface protein, there are other mechanisms by which our body could react to the flu that, that we really don't even know about. And we're still, to this day, we've been working on flu for 100 years, roughly, and we still discover something new each day. And so there's, I guess what the public should know is that the vaccine itself right now is your best mechanism for being protected against flu. If you want a, anywhere from a 30 to 80% less likelihood of getting flu, get the vaccine. That's to say, though, that there are improvements that are actively being worked on, like going after different portions of the virus. So right under that globular head is a stalk that holds the vi that, that head up from the, the virion itself. And there are mechanisms by which researchers are trying to create antibodies for that location that's more conserved across all of the different H and N combinations. So you wouldn't have to worry if you got an H7N9 infection because your body would react with going after a different portion of it. And so there are efforts to sort of come up with different ways to address an infection and sort of characterize how our body responds to these flu viruses. And, and we're still learning more and more every day, but get your flu vaccine, that's for sure. <laughs> that's important. And how does the flu vaccine actually work? Like I, I take it and then my body develops antibodies to a certain type or? Yeah. So those recommendations that are given to FDA to create candidate vaccine viruses to be distributed to the industry, they grow them in eggs like I, I had mentioned, and those eggs amplify up the virus and then you can inactivate it or attenuate it, and then that's what's inserted into your body and your, and, and your body would react to those surface proteins and create antibodies against it so that hopefully when the virus that you do get exposed to that will ultimately cause disease, you will have already had protection against it because you've seen a vaccine that will not cause disease that will allow you to uh, fight it off. And I know you mentioned beforehand that um, during the flu season it may take a bit to get the vaccine made. Um, and you mentioned in the past, like with the swine flu, if an epidemic breaks out or pandemic, you said, uh, or something big changes in the virus, um, what does that look like? How quickly can we react to say, hey, maybe we need to get a new strain vaccinated or how do we adapt? So the, the issue with the pandemic is the, the uncertainty around it. And so the key thing to remember about 2009, for instance, was that it hit not in the normal influenza season when you think of you know getting sick in November, December, January. Uh, that was in the really in the summer that it was starting to take off and it was almost fixed by the time that influenza season came later on. And I remember sitting at meetings with, with vaccine manufacturers and, and them talking about the realistic turnaround in these things. And, and maybe it would take a few months to ultimately get the product distributed, but I think the number that I last heard was that within six to 12 months of that 2009 influenza pandemic, less than 1% of the global population actually had the means to be vaccinated. So we're talking about less than 1% of the global population had access to, the, within six to 12 months, to that vaccine. So an emergency vaccine is sort of the only way forward and to really prevent that next pandemic would be to sort of flip it on its head and totally restructure the way we manufacture vaccines. And I think that's, I mean, there's competing opinions of all of this, but as we saw with 2009, when we were faced with our first modern flu vaccine manufacturing process situation with a pandemic, we were still lacking severely. And you mentioned too, that could also tie in, if that universal flu vaccine is able to be kind of formulated, that could help if we have a larger distribution network that could work alongside that? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, and it might not just be one thing that prevents it. I mean, you, you're talking about antiviral stocks that need to be built up. There, there are, you know, the biggest thing about a pandemic is probably not going to be the response on the vaccine side. In, in a way, it's going to be these, vac these viruses knock out, in 2009, for instance, that knocked out you and I, you know, like normal average adults. 
it's not knocking out elderly or children anymore. I mean, that much more than a seasonal influenza. You are knocking out the working population. And so you're talking about healthcare providers, you're talking about industry, the, the people who create the vaccine, uh, you're talking about people who create ventilators and IVs, and all of that is the scary scenario with a pandemic that would just incentivize you to, to, to sort of work on getting these universal vaccines that might be quicker and be distributed more quickly so that you are keeping up with the ability to take care of your normal everyday, well, infections during a pandemic, for instance. How concerned should the population be about influenza and a possible outbreak like the Spanish flu again? Well, I, I would say that it, to echo Dr. Schoberg earlier and, and a, a phrase that's used ad nauseum is you, when you've seen one flu season, you've seen one flu season. The, the issue is, is that we don't know what's coming. We don't know if tomorrow there will be a reassortment event or any kind of unique situation that gives rise to another 1918 Spanish influenza scenario. I will say that globally, public health professionals know that this is a threat. This is the most important threat, likely. When you talk about Ebola, everybody gets super scared by Ebola because of the mortality rate. But in reality, Ebola is horrible at transmission. And so you're talking about the spread through bodily fluids. Pandemic influenza is the threat because it is so easily transmissible and can go across the globe, like in 1918, like in 2009. And so while the normal public has a very easy response to this, get vaccinated. That's your easiest mechanism to fight. If everybody got vaccinated, we'd be even controlling it that much more. But it's because there are some anti-science communities out there that raise questions about whether you should get the vaccine or not. And, and those are the things, that's as big a public health threat, anti-science is as big a public health threat as actually creating a good and effective vaccine. And so we are sitting here in our positions and working with CDC and WHO for you guys, for the DOD service members and for the general public to monitor that threat. And while, yeah, you should be concerned, there are easy ways to control it. Wash your hands and get vaccinated. And we will continue to watch out for uh, those events and, w the, and we'll have uh, appropriate responses down the line to those uh, and working together with everybody across the globe to try to fight it. And let me also add to that, Looking at the Spanish flu, and, and, and Dr. Fries had mentioned that, what did it impact? It impacted that young population, those workers, and why was that? Well, in the elderly population, it is thought that they had some exposure, even though the virus probably had reassortment, but they had some exposure and had some immunity, so it did not impact that population. Well, how do you get immunity? Well, one is getting your, your immunization, getting vaccinated, and getting vaccinated every year. And to, just to, to add on to that, and so as I think about it, how, how would we prevent a, an outbreak of uh, the transmission to prevent something that even if something was novel? Well, one, what does vaccination do? Vaccination protects you from getting infected. It, it makes your immune system able to attack it. And then what else do you need? You need transmission. You need transmission from the virus from one person to the other. And that's where hand washing comes in. And so that's why you always, always hear us say, get vaccinated and wash your hands. It keeps you from getting infected and breaks the transmission. And I may add, you can cut this if you want, but going back to research in the future and the best way to control these, the, the virus. I think the most fascinating area of research is this idea of anagenic sin. And it's this idea where the, just like Dr. Schoberg had mentioned earlier, the flu influenza that you're first encountering in your life, whether it be when you're five years old or 10 years old, your body responds to it appropriately and fights it. And the type that it is may influence and what we're really discovering now as we go forward in research is, is that that may inhibit your ability to fight a seasonal influenza. And so the idea that this anagenic sin, your first encounter with influenza, influences the entirety of your life. And that almost independently and, and individual responses 
are across the, the, the spectrum. Like you could have a different response to H3. Even though Dr. Schoberg and I uh, may have had H1N1 last year, our response to H1N1 next year may be completely different based on our previous experiences. And that's why we look so closely at sort of prior influenza infections and whether we're vaccinated appropriately. Um, and so I just wanted to add in that there are so many fascinating areas that we barely have scraped the surface on in influenza research uh, that might define how we treat it and, and control it in the future. That just reinforces, like you said, getting vaccines, staying on top of it. Right. And so since our military population is so heavily vaccinated, you can probably see how effective, like, like I would imagine right now you're probably to see able to see how effective the vaccine would be based on what people were given last year or this year and how it appears in our military populations and their dependents. Right. And uh, so one thing like I was mentioning before, uh, as we work the surveillance on that is, yes, it is very helpful, one, for protecting the health of our population by having it heavily vaccinated. But then also, if individuals are infected and they were vaccinated, those then are viruses that are, are very much of interest. Why, why is the person ill with influenza? Is it because the virus changed or was, was there something else? So it gives us that ability in that highly vaccinated population to focus in on those viruses and to see, okay, yes, there has been some change. And yes, this year's vaccine did not uh, protect against that. We do vaccine effectiveness looking at that both uh, at the middle of the year to help uh, present to the FDA and WHO and then also at the end of the year just to you know evaluate how, how good was the vaccine this year and why. Uh, looking at okay we were starting to see these mutations these changes and then that helps make some decisions for okay we might need to tweak next year's vaccine. To, to build off of that, our service members are highly vaccinated and that creates a different scenario than what we experience in the general population. And so in the general population, you may have 40% of the population that's vaccinated, anywhere from 40 to 60%. But if you're talking about 95% of our service members, active duty that are vaccinated, something that we really look closely at from a DOD perspective is whether that is the most effective and appropriate means to vaccinate our service members because they aren't exactly reacting the same way as Joe on the street that may have gotten a vaccine every other year or maybe picks it every three years, should be getting it every year. But we're talking about potential, we explore the idea of potentially over vaccinating. So we've leveraged our relationships with a lot of the DOD research labs to look more closely at whether that is an effective means. And so in this whole effort of trying to come up with a universal vaccine and creating a better vaccine, there's also the introspective look at whether we're vaccinating appropriately with the current vaccines we have now. So it truly is being attacked from multiple angles. Like many people may not understand just how much goes in to making a vaccine. Indeed, yes, mm -hmm. that is an understatement. <laughs> That's, that is incredible. That's a great message for people because they may not know. So I think you touched on it earlier, though. Uh, a question that we had um, was, when you say something is a novel virus, is that something that is a new virus, something that you guys have not seen before? It is anything in the zoonotic or something that's been sitting around and hasn't been seen for a while. So in, in the course of history, we've had about four of these pandemic events. In 1918, you may have heard of the Spanish influenza. Uh, that was the big one. That was a novel flu, hadn't been seen before, knocks out 50 million people globally. Ugh. Not knocks out, kills 50 million people globally. So we're talking about a serious event. And, and so novel is the idea that we hadn't seen it before. In 1957, there was an H2N2, which is a type we haven't seen since about 1968. And so there was a period of about 11 years there where it circulated, haven't seen it since at any point it could reemerge. H2 still circulates in swine. And so it's just sitting there on the surface. And so when we talk about novel, we talk about something immunologically in humans that we've not seen or that we're not used to. And that's like you touched on before, what we're constantly trying to prepare for, at least to have enough stuff to help people if that does start to begin to spread again. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So a question we usually love to ask uh, people as we kind of round things up here, our uh, listeners, I'd uh, like to hear if you have a favorite piece of Air Force technology or a researcher you really respect, uh, can tie into vaccination, or really anything in Air Force history then or now. 
Well, yeah. I'll start as, as I thought of this. Uh, growing up, um, I enjoyed uh, airplanes, uh, reading, uh, history, and one thing that always fascinated me was uh, the flying wing. And so, you know, one aspect is just to see how uh, technology and uh, bringing on the stealth, the B-2, and, and it's just, to me, that is just fascinating, amazing to see that fly and then plus giving us that, that global reach, that global power that it provides. So for me, yeah, it's just seeing how that, that changed, how that evolved and, and what we have now. And did that love kind of pull you into wanting to work for the Air Force, or is that just a passion you've always Yes, had? I originally started as a practicing large animal veterinarian, and um, the ability to be able to move, to, to travel, had always kind of been in, been in me, and so when I got a card from a recruiter, uh, I signed up and joined the Air Force. That's wonderful. <laughs> large animals, so there's like elephants or... Uh, da or dairy practice, which dairy I also practice? think has, flows very well into my, my role now as public health and epidemiology, looking at populations. And so for me, it was populations of dairy cattle, farmers, making sure that disease was not spreading amongst their animals or then spreading from farm to farm. And, you know, segued well into public health within the Air Force, where I'm now protecting people disease and now specifically influenza, trying to keep influenza where it doesn't impact us. Uh, I guess I'm biased. I, obviously, I, th I think I spend half my day just looking out on the airfield to wait for some fighter or, you know, <laughs> something to come through. Yeah. But uh, in terms of my favorite piece of Air Force technology, it would probably be the fact that in 1976, our program that we have right now is built upon a, a project that was called Project Gargle, um, where a, it was originated by the Air Force, whereby they, some geniuses back then, had the idea to really take a, an introspective look within the Air Force at what's impacting our force health. And so they had this effort across the globe to, to characterize, and it mostly started as influenza lookout, but has really morphed into a DOD-wide surveillance program that now the Epi Lab and DHA sort of co-leverage um, and run, and, and it all started in the Air Force in 1976, to the point where my doctoral advisor at Ohio State had been originally there in active duty in, in 1976 and inspired me to go into influenza in the first place and I ultimately end up here working on the derivative of Project Gargle down the line. Wow, still influencing you today, that's great. Oh, without question, yeah. Influencing our warfighters, trying to keep them healthy. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Oh, it was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. On us too, thanks. Make sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube at AF Research Lab. And remember, stay curious. Logging off.